My name is Serena Sabah, and as an introduction, I've got three statements about myself for you. And um, I would like you to decide which one is false. Now, there are three statements, and only two are true, but one is false. Okay, so out of these statements, I want you to just have a little think which could be true and which could be false. So only one is false and two are true. I'd like you to just note down for me, which two do you think are true and which one do you think is false? But that's not enough for me. I would like you to think about why. Okay, so just put a little note as to which numbers are true, so two of them, and why do you think they're true and which number is false and why do you think it's false? Okay. And I'll tell you just in a moment if you got it right or wrong. Okay. So play along with me and decide which one's false and which two are true. Okay. Are we ready for the answer? So number one is false and number two and three are true. So I was born in Halifax in Yorkshire in the north of England and I studied um, all of my school and education in the UK. And I have lived without electricity for three years whilst I was working as a teacher trainer in Nepal, um, in the high Himalayas and in the middle hill Himalayas of Nepal. And through that experience, I've actually learned how uh, the world isn't very equal for many of us. Um, I may look like I was born in India because my parents are from India. And so I've also uh, been there and experienced life there as well, uh, as well as living and working in, in a variety of countries in, in all of the continents apart from Antarctica. Um, and so that I think has given me a, a certain insight into how diversity, equity and inclusion doesn't exist everywhere. And it's helped me in, in concentrating on sustainable education in particular. Uh, so that's, that's where I'm coming from um, in terms of the discussion today. Okay, so I'd like to share with you this little cartoon from Ander cartoons, um, andersoncartoons.com. Possessive pronouns, mine, yours, ours, his, her. And the student is saying, wouldn't it just be easier if, we, if you write your name on everything so you know what belongs to who? Now, it's a nice little fun way of thinking about pronouns. Um, but also a lot of people seem to think that when we're talking about diversity and equity, it's all about uh, her or she or he or his or how we refer to people. Um, but that also brings to light, I think, why English language is, is rather important in the whole discussion about diversity, equity and inclusion, because language very much can exclude or include people. And pronouns is just one way of thinking about it. Um, and they, we usually teach they as a noun for the, the plural subject. But actually, it can be used as a singular subject. If you don't know who you're talking about, you don't know the gender of the person, it's actually quite possible to use they in the singular form. So you can say, um, uh, let's hope they are a team player. Someone's coming to the meeting, someone's coming to join your, your team to work on something. You have no idea what their gender is doesn't matter, you can refer to them as they. And that's one thing that we can actually teach with language too. Uh, with English language, you don't have to actually decide for the third person singular if they're male or female. And there are lots of other things we can do. We usually use pictures to ask our students to talk about what's happening. So I'm going to give you a picture now and say, what's happening in this picture? Um, what can you see? Who are the individuals? Who are the people? Um, and what's going on? 
So this is a typical kind of picture that you can bring up. I don't know if you've seen this image before. Um, it became quite viral at one point. It's taken from um, a BBC News video clip, um, as you can see, BBC News there. And it was an interview that was done with a political expert um, living in South Korea. And just as the interview started, um, the little girl with the yellow jumper came into the room in the background and her brother followed. Uh, you can't actually see him in, in this clip. And then this lady appeared in the doorway, obviously looking very worried that the fact that the children are in there during a BBC interview. And there was a Twitter storm around this video clip. People were, were commenting how funny it was. It was pre-pandemic, pre-COVID times, of course. Um, so uh, it's become a norm now. But uh, in 2017, it was not the normal thing to see on a BBC news clip. And at one point, the clip um, produced these comments about who the woman was. And quite a few people assumed she was the nanny. And she was rushing into the room and she took the children out of the room. Um, and then comments started appearing saying, well, why do you think she's the nanny? Could she not be the mother? Uh, and it was generally assumed that she couldn't be the mother because we've got a white male expert in the video clip and they expected him to be in a, a relationship with another person of a similar background. And it turned out that in fact, she wasn't the nanny, she was the mother of the children, his uh, wife. Uh, and afterwards, after lots of, of publicity around the video clip, um, they had this interview with the whole family and they discussed all of these things. So it was very interesting for me to, to see all of this discussion and all of these assumptions taking place about her identity and who she was. Now, it tells us a lot about what we think, what our impressions of society um, are when we, we see this kind of thing happening. Now, that was pre-pandemic. During the pandemic, um, another interesting thing happened that I noticed. Uh, and this was um, an interview with two professionals uh, that was taken on a, a BBC uh, Good Morning Britain. So it's a breakfast show. Sorry, not BBC, it's ITV. A uh, breakfast show called Good Morning Britain back in the UK. And... Uh, they had these two um, professionals talking about what was going on with COVID and the measures, etc. Now, I wonder if you notice anything about these two individuals. You've got the names on screen, yeah? But only one of them is a professor, according to the label that this ITV programme gave them. Now, it turns out that Angus Dalglish is a professor. He's a professor of oncology. Uh, he's well known for his research on HIV AIDS. Um, and he's a, a professor at the University College London. Devi Sridhar is also a professor. Um, she's a professor of and chair of global public health at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, she's also um, co-chair of Harvard School of Public Health and London School of Hygiene of Tropical Medicine, uh, the independent panel on global response to Ebola. Uh, she's a guest lecturer at Harvard School of Public Health. Um, she's an associate fellow at Chatham House Centre on Global Health Security. And this interview was done in 2021. Now, they're both professors. One is was a 71 year old white male because this interview was done last year and one was a 37 year old uh, female of color who's not white um, and that's the difference so although it may seem like a slight that 
that he was called Professor and she wasn't. It's interesting to think about why that happened, why these assumptions are taking place. So what we can do in the classroom is raise awareness of our biases because we all have them. It's, it's a fact. We all are conditioned in society with various biases. And we can help our students to identify their own biases and tackle the idea of stereotypes. We can question why stereotypes exist, uh, learn how to recognize one's own biases and think about what we can do to reduce them. And here I came across um, uh, a children's story, a really lovely book called Just Like Me. And I've just taken a clip, uh, an image from one of the pages there. And um, the, the child, the main character says, I want to invite Zarina. She wants to be a ballerina, just like me. And there are two things here that, that really leapt off the page at me. First of all, there's a character in the book called Zarina, who shares the same name as me. And I have to say, until I saw this, I have never seen a character, a child um, in a children's book with the same name as me. I grant you slightly different spelling, but growing up in the UK, I never experienced that. And even as an adult, I got a slight thrill seeing a, a character with my name on the page. And then I thought, how often have I seen characters in wheelchairs? Um, in storybooks or actually in, in everyday kind of fiction at all. Um, and I thought about it and I did a little research. And in 1989, in Hollywood film, My Left Foot, there was the main character in a wheelchair. In 2011, the French film, The Intouchables, um, the main character was also in a wheelchair. Avatar was another film where the main character is um, in a wheelchair. So we don't see many examples of positive characters in wheelchairs. There are other films, but they tend to be um, to represent the sad and rather depressing life of someone in a wheelchair, but you don't get very many positive um, um, characters to give a role model for other people in wheelchairs. So it's really important what we do in the classroom reflect society um, as it is. And I'm not talking about a, a, a ideal reflection, but actually just representing people. And why? Why should we do that? Well, in our classrooms, we have individuals, we have different kinds of students in any classroom across the world. And when we accept that there are differences, we build respect. It's not that you have to be one type of person to be a successful student in the classroom. We build trust to say, okay, we all have our flaws. We all have our little idiosyncrasies or differences, but that's okay. And it's okay to say that you are different and that you maybe have a problem learning this type of thing or doing X, Y, or Z. And that helps our students to feel safe in the classroom, that they're not pretending to be clever. They're not pretending to have understood what the teacher said, but to be able to say, um, actually, could you just explain that again? Because I didn't get it. And no one's going to laugh at you no one's going to make fun of you if we have this accepting atmosphere in the classroom that only really the teacher can build up. The students at the end of the day are going to reflect the behavior of you as a teacher. So if we've got bullying or if we've got sniggering or making fun of, of other students in the classroom while things are going on, that actually reflects something that we as a teacher haven't addressed. And so that is a really good reason to encourage learning and encourage safe learning. 
And with languages, especially if you don't feel safe and you don't trust those around you, then you're not going to be willing to open your mouth and speak and partake and participate in activities, which especially for communicative activities, you need your students to be able to do. And that's in, from a classroom perspective. From a, a, a more responsible perspective for, for the outside world, we can also counter hate. So we can counteract all of the negative um, images that there may be out there in the world. Um, we can change societal pressure to be in a particular way or a, a particular type of person to be able to be yourself, to be the individual that we all are. And if your students are already adults, then we can change the mindset of how to behave responsible, responsibly in the real world. So for younger students, we're preparing our students to be more responsible people in the real world when they get there and they finish their education. And for adults, we're helping them um, change their mindset in terms of how they think about others um, in society. And I'd like to share with you what Jackie Wright, the Vice President and Chief Digital Officer of Microsoft US said. She said that at the end of the day, it really is about mindset because how you start and how you think about things will define your life. So it's about who we are. And we're helping our students to define who they are as well. And that really, I think, fits nicely with the English language teaching classroom um, because English language provides power as a tool that we can use um, when you can speak English and use it in a communicative way, then it allows you to enter into the world of business, the world of science, engineering, tourism, um, uh, in terms of global um, communications across different branches of the same company. So we're allowing language to be used positively and we're teaching our students how to do that positively and respectfully across cultures as well. And so it's very much part of, I would say, language teaching. So if that's what we're, we mean by diversity, equity and inclusion in the English language teaching classroom, how do we do it? Well, in terms of diversity, we do it by accepting and acknowledging that we have differently abled students in our class. Instead of saying, oh, so-and-so is, is just lazy and doesn't do their homework, we maybe look for reasons why they're not able to complete the work that has been expected of them. Maybe they're physically differently abled, in which case it may be a visible um, disability. But then you may have students with learning difficulties which are more invisible. Similarly with neurodiversity, the way we learn and the way we can absorb information is different depending on what type of person you are. I don't know about you, but um, if there's lots of background noise or there's music going on somewhere, I find it really hard to just focus and concentrate on what I'm supposed to be doing. I have to put my earplugs in without any music, uh, just to, to, to um, have a barrier to the sound, and then I can really concentrate. Um, and these are neurodiverse differences between us. Um, and at the same time, we can have economically disadvantaged students, which really came to light during the COVID pandemic that, that's still ongoing in many parts of the world. Um, where students don't have access to reliable internet. So maybe they can't um, find out information or they can't access their online classes. Um, familial health problems. Is your student a carer for a member of their family? Therefore, they have a lot of responsibility at home and so they have less time to do their homework. There are gender differences around the world that... Um, Young girls are expected to help in the home before they're allowed or given time to do their homework. 
Um, and when they do actually do their homework, they're exhausted because they've been doing all the other chores that they had to do beforehand. Um, then there are race differences. Um, but if students are, are not able to, to participate in classes because of, of bullying, because of um, differences in their home situation, um, if they're from marginalized communities because of race as well, um, that all has an effect on digital access and digital access can have an effect on their education as we've seen. When it comes to equity then, um, is everyone able to absorb the information that you're providing to your students? Now, the first point there is not using fancy writing. So as you can see, when you use a fancy writing, whether it's on the blackboard or on a handout or on the whiteboard, it's not quite so easy to, to read, especially if you've got dyslexic students. Um, you know, is, is that an N or is that a, a fancy A at the beginning? So make sure you don't use fancy fonts, clear fonts, large font sizes, Maybe students have a visual problem where um, they can't see very easily from the back of the classroom if you're back in the classroom. Um, make sure you provide visual clues as to what you're saying. So if you're giving instructions, don't just give them orally. Have the instructions on a sheet of paper or on the screen behind you um, or on a poster so that if they forget or they can't hold information, when they've heard it orally, um, they can refer to it and, and see it. Activities using art and color and, and shapes and paintings, music and IT allows students who have different strengths um, to be able to uh, display what they know in different forms rather than just in the written form. Allow movement at some point in your class, whether it's online or actually physically in the classroom. If you can say, you know, go and find something red in the room, go and get it um, if, if you're not in an online class, or uh, can you go and point to something red in the classroom and everybody rushes to, to one part of the room. That gives a little bit of movement to students who need to move every now and again. Um, keep a cap on the noise. So it's good to have good noise in the classroom, but maybe not for the whole 45 minute, 50 minute period of your lesson. Have moments of quiet so students can concentrate as well if they can't cope with noise. Change activity and pace, change the, the tone of your voice. And if you're doing a, a listening activity, use transcripts as well so that they can refer to the words after listening, after trying to, to do the, the listening part of, of a lesson. And in terms of inclusion, are all your students represented? Do they feel like they can see themselves in examples? So use a variety of names. Um, if you're doing an example on, on the board, don't just use names from, from the textbook, you know, use names from your own classroom students. Um, and just like me seeing my name in, in the children's book, if they see their name in an example, it'll make them sit up and just take a bit more notice. Uh, do the images you use reflect the kind of students you have? Do they see themselves in, um, in examples, in video clips, in images that you use to, to portray examples of, of language. Break down biases when you, you spot the bias and explore the assumptions together. What assumptions are you making about the characters? Question any stereotypes that you're aware of um, and reflect on any prejudices that they have. And that helps them feel part of the class and part of a whole community, uh, which is what we're trying to create at the end of the day, a community of learners who are willing to learn and help each other through the classroom. And that all builds into 
um, the sustainable development goals, actually. So when we do those together, when we've got an acceptance of diversity, when we as, as teachers differentiate the learning and say, okay, I know that this group of students, they need to go at a slightly slower pace than this group of students, then you could have once a week a class where they're doing different things. They're still all maybe covering the present tense, but they're doing it in a different way. And you've got three or four different activities going on at the same time. And maybe they, they move around the activities so they all get a feel of, of the different activities. It's not just a special set of activities for the clever ones, but it's a set of different style of activities for the different students. When you've got equity going on that way through the, the types of things that you're doing in the classroom, and then you've got inclusion. You are giving the message out that I know you're different. I accept your differences. Uh, we all need to tolerate our own differences. And this is how we're going to deal with it. And I'm including you. I'm not forgetting you. I'm not excluding you. I'm not only giving my classes to the most academic students in my class. And sometimes to do that, we need to move away from the textbook. And if that's the case, you might be interested in this book that helps you to write your own inclusive materials. Um, and it's, it's just for teachers who do often prepare their own materials. And they all go towards working towards those um, sustainable development goals. And I'd like to uh, share this quote with you by Ver Verne Myers who said, biases are the stories we make up about people before we know who they are. If we don't consider what life is like um, with someone who is differently able, if we don't consider what it's like if you look different to everyone else in your classroom, if you don't know what it's like in the shoes of another gender or if a, a person in a in, in a situation who doesn't actually identify as any particular gender, then we don't understand how it is living life through their experiences. But if we actually get to know how different people experience the world, then we come to understand their stories and they're not so weird, they're not so different and they become just like you and me. And so, we can tackle uh, sustainable development goal number four, which is quality education for all, not just the bright ones, but for all of the ones, even the ones who are struggling, we can give them a helping hand and acknowledge that, yes, you've got these struggles, but it's not because you're, you're, you're a bit stupid or dumb or lazy. It's because we just learn in different ways. And maybe I haven't been teaching in the way that helps you learn. And that's an acknowledgement. Sustainable development goal number five is about gender equality, that um, people have different access to education depending on their gender. And we, we need to, to actually put that right. And sustainable development goal number 10 is to reduce inequalities, whether that's through sex or race or economic oppression, or if we're differently abled. So I would say that diversity, equity and inclusion is not the new kid in town at all. It's been there all along, but we haven't maybe been willing to address it. And now I think is the time to do that. Yes, we're all talking about it, but it's not just a new fad. It's just something that I think we've become more aware of and, and realize that we need to do something about it. So I hope you agree with me that it fits nicely into English language education. So thanks for, for watching this. And maybe you can join me in one of the live sessions that I'm doing later on. Thank you.